Hello, and welcome to 3.1, Inertial and Non-Inertial Frames of Reference. This is the start of Chapter 3, and in Chapter 3 we're going to be talking about circular motion. But before we can get into that, we need to lay a few ideas down. This idea is talking about frames of reference, which you might remember from Chapter 1.6, where we were doing relative motion. So a frame of reference is just some reference point that we use to make our measurements from. So we could say that often a common frame of reference is we would say that the Earth is our frame of reference and I might be measuring my movement relative to the Earth. But if I was on a boat then maybe I'd be rel measuring relative to the water speed and then I could measure the water speed relative to the Earth. That sort of thing. That's our frame of reference. So it's just what point are we measuring our speed or our acceleration or that sort of thing from. And we have two types of reference frames. We have inertial reference frames and non-inertial frames. That's the topic of this lesson. So, we're talking about inertia. If you remember the law of inertia, that is Newton's first law. Newton's first law. And the gist of that was that if there's no net force in a system, no net force, well that means that there is no acceleration, which also means that there is no change in velocity. That's inertia. Something doesn't accelerate unless there's a net force. If there's no net force, then we don't accelerate. We don't change velocity. So that's the law of inertia. And we say that that's a law, but it doesn't actually hold in all frames. That's why we have these two types of frames. We have inertial frames of reference. This first one is a frame of reference that is not accelerating. And that's pretty important. It's not accelerating. So that means we, we have a velocity is zero or constant. And in these frames, the law of inertia holds. But we have another type of frame of reference, non-inertial. This is where this is a frame that is not, or sorry, that is accelerating. And in this sort of a frame, the law of inertia does not hold. So if my frame of reference is accelerating, if I'm measuring my movement relative to some car that's speeding away from me and it's getting faster and faster, well, then the law of inertia doesn't apply anymore because my frame of reference itself is accelerating. So when we said, well, there's, I can have no net force on myself, but in my, using my frame of reference, it looks like I have acceleration because my frame is accelerating away from me. So all of a sudden, the law of inertia breaks when our frame of reference is not inertial, when it is accelerating. And that's the topic of this lesson here, is when we have a frame that's accelerating, the law of inertia doesn't really apply anymore. And it gives rise to something called fictitious forces. So in these non-inertial frames, we have fictitious forces. They are non-existent forces. Non-existent forces. that explain the motion of objects in non-inertial frames. So when I've got some non-inertial frame it might appear that I'm accelerating, even though the forces say that I shouldn't. We need to add these extra fictitious forces to explain what's going on. So we'll see that in this first problem here, okay? 
Let's take a look at this problem. It's a person on a bus. Actually, not a person. It's a cork ball on a bus. So this says, a teacher suspends a small cork ball from the ceiling of a bus. When the bus accelerates at a constant rate forward, the string suspending the ball makes an angle of 10 degrees with the vertical. Calculate the magnitude of the acceleration of the bus. So if you understand here, we're saying, I'm on this bus. This is my bus. And I've put a cork ball on a string. And instead of the string hanging straight down on the bus, well now the string makes this angle of 10 degrees from the vertical. So that's 10 degrees there. I'll just write that over there. That's 10 degrees. And so now the question is, well, what is the acceleration of the bus? Well, first we're going to look at this using our inertial frame of reference. So here's me. I'm standing off of the bus, and I'm just watching the bus go by. Okay? So that's me. I'm on the ground. The ground is not accelerating, so I am in a non-inertial frame of reference. So from my non-inertial frame, non-inertial, I can draw a free body diagram. So I see this, this, um, this cork ball here, and I can say, well, obviously it has gravity acting downwards on it. And the other thing it has to have is this tension. The string is pulling it on this angle. It's an angle of 10 degrees, and that force is my tension force. And that's all that's happening. There's not, no other forces acting on this ball. So then I can go ahead and do some math on that. I can say, well, mg, you can see here the net force on, on this free body diagram, the net force is not zero. The vertical needs to ca cancel out. Then you can see that I'm going to have some horizontal component that's not cancelled out. So we'll, uh, we'll do that process here. We can say that mg downwards has to equal ft cosine 10 degrees. That's so that the net vertical force is zero, because it's not falling into the ground or anything. So then I can rearrange that. I can say the tension force is equal to mg over cosine 10 degrees. Cool. Now, I can say that the net force, well, the net force is just this horizontal piece. That's my net force. This is Ft sine 10 degrees. And I can also say that, of course, net force is equal to ma. That's always true. The net force is always equal to mass times the acceleration. OK, so now I can do some rearranging here. I can replace my Ft with this value up here of Ft and um, set these things all equal to each other. So I have Ma, that's one of the values of net force, is equal to Ft, so that's mg over cosine 10 times the sine of 10 degrees. Good, and you see that um, that ma, there's an m, there's an mg, so those cancel each other out. So now we don't care about the mass, it's all, um, all good, so now I can solve for the acceleration. a is equal to g times sine 10 over cosine 10 of 10 degrees, which is equal to g tan of 10 degrees. Okay, and now I can solve that. I've got 9.8 tan 10 degrees, and so my acceleration is equal to 1.7 meters per second squared. And there's my solution. I did that just using my non-inertial frame. I just stood away from my uh, bus. I said, here's the bus rolling by, and I was just trying to figure out the acceleration then. Because what I'm saying is, that means that this ball needs to be accelerating in that direction by some amount, and it's accelerating at the same speed as the bus. And I think that makes sense. Okay, if I had done that with... Um, oh, and I, I'm sorry. Right from the very start, I said this was a non-inertial... This was an inertial frame of reference that we were solving with. And I'm sorry about that. So we were doing that all with an inertial frame. I was standing just on the ground. If I had looked at that from on the bus, though, 
So this is my inertial frame. If I had been on the bus looking at it, this is my non-inertial frame. There's my non-inertial frame. Well, then all I see is this, um, this ball, this cork that isn't accelerating, so that means the net force has to be zero. So if I was to sort of put over here my non-inertial picture, it's not accelerating from my point of view. When I'm on the bus, it looks like it's just standing there in front of me. So then if I was to draw the free body diagram, I know it's not accelerating. So I can say, okay, it's got mg downwards. Okay, it's got some sort of tension up here. This is 10 degrees. So it's got ft. And then I say, well, it's not accelerating. Let's clean that up here. It's not accelerating. So the net force has to be zero. So there has to be something canceling out that tension. So I just, this is some imaginary force. And I'll just call that F imagine, I-M-A-G for now. I don't know, I don't have a good name for that, but this is some imaginary force that needs to be in there. Um, and that's what we were talking about up here, this fictitious force. It's some fictitious force that needs to be cancelling everything out. And then I could go on and I could then solve for what that imaginary force would be. It would be this same value, 1.7 meters per second squared. And I say, well, that has to be the acceleration of the bus. That's how these inertial, non-inertial um, frames work. Okay, we'll take a look at the second page here. So on the second page, we're talking about another idea here in these um, inertial frames and non-inertial frames. Apparent weight. So apparent weight, that's how heavy it feels like you are. And so this is the magnitude of the normal force acting on an object in a non-inertial frame. That's the apparent weight. And so what that means is, um, if you've ever been on something like this, which is like the drop tower at Canada's Wonderland or, or that sort of a thing, it drops you really, really, really fast downwards. Well, and when you're doing that, it generally feels like you have less weight to the point where if you're going fast enough, it feels like you're weightless. It feels like you're just sort of floating. I mean, obviously you're falling downwards, but from sort of this perspective, if you had um, a floor underneath you, then it would feel like you don't have, have any weight at all. And likewise, if you're going in an elevator, and your elevator is moving up very, very, very fast, you'll actually feel heavier. It feels like you are um, being squashed downwards because you're accelerating upwards. And so that's just because the normal force that you're experiencing is different in these different frames. So that here, if I'm accelerating upwards, that means the, the floor is pushing me upwards, which means that it's giving me a larger normal force, which makes me feel heavier. Whereas in this situation, if I'm falling straight down, well, the, the floor doesn't actually have to do anything here at all, and so it's not giving me any normal force, and I feel weightless. Okay, and so that's what we're talking about here, is that the magnitude of that normal force is how heavy we feel. All right, so we'll do a, a couple problems with that. This says an elevator accelerates upward with an acceleration of a magnitude 1.5 meters per second squared, after which it moves with a constant velocity. So our ele ele elevator is going up 1.5 meters per second squared to start with, and then it slows down to a constant velocity. As the elevator approaches its stopping point, it undergoes a downwards acceleration of magnitude 0.9 meters per second squared. We want to calculate the apparent weight of the passenger during each of these phases. So to start with, well, I've said we, we're moving, accelerating upwards at 1.5. So I'm just going to draw my pictures here. I have mg, and I have normal force. And here I've drawn my normal force as larger than mg, because I'm accelerating upwards. I can make a statement like this. I can say net force equals ma. That's always true. I can always say net force equals ma. That's Newton's second law. 
And the other thing that net force is equal to is, well, we need to add up all these pieces. So I have Fn going upwards minus Mg going downwards. And that's how a lot of good force problems start, is, is framing it this way. So I can rewrite that then. I can say Ma is equal to Fn minus Mg. Good. Now I can use that. I can rearrange to solve for the normal force. Fn is equal to Ma plus Mg, which is equal to mass times A plus G. And now I can plug in some numbers here. So I can say this is equal to 75 times 1.5 plus 9.8. And this gives me 850 newtons. There we go. So that tells me my normal force, which is my apparent weight. So if you ever see a problem that says, what is the apparent weight? The answer is, solve for the normal force. That is what these problems are about. OK, so we'll look at the next problem. The elevator is now moving at a constant velocity. Well, I can draw my picture here. Mg, Fn. Notice I've drawn those to be the same, because now they are equal. My net force equals Ma, and that also equals Fn minus Mg. Notice I've written this exactly the same way as in the last problem. Those statements are all the same. Now I can do this. Fn is equal to Ma plus Mg, which is equal to Um, well, I can say this is equal to m times a plus g. Notice this is all still exactly the same. I didn't really have to rewrite any of this. So my mass was 75. Now finally I can say my acceleration here, well, I'm not accelerating, zero. So I just get 75 times g, which gives me 740 newtons. Perfect. And finally, now I'm accelerating downwards at um, what's my at 0 0.9 meters per second squared. So if I draw my picture here, I've got mg and fn. Notice I've drawn fn to be smaller because now I'm accelerating downwards. The net force needs to be downwards. So same statements. exact same statements, Ma equals Fn minus Mg, and then I can say Fn equals Ma plus Mg, A plus G. All of that was the same, and you don't really have to be writing this each time. That's okay. So, 75. Now my acceleration is downward, so I want to put negative 0 0.9 plus 9.8, and this gives me 670 newtons. So you can see that my apparent weight when I'm going upwards, accelerating upwards, is larger than when I'm going at a constant speed, which is larger than when I'm accelerating downwards. And that's the, the main idea here. Okay, that is the end of the lesson, and I will see you in the next one.